Howdy folks, Tech Scrabney here with Tech Scrabney Outdoors. I hope you guys are ready for a deep dive because I'm going to be giving you guys a buyer's guide for traditional archery. And I've got a lot of ground to cover. I've got a lot of things to talk about. This video may be boring, but then again, it's not like you're probably doing anything else with your time right now. So I hope that this is going to educate and entertain you with everything that's going on in the world right now and in the U.S. It's a scary time. So with that being said, while I don't encourage panic buying, I do encourage sensible prepping. Now, I am also not a primitive archer. I've never successfully built a self-bow. I've never napped a flint point, And I'm no good with working with wood arrows. The good news is we're not blown back to the Stone Age just yet. So supplies are out there. I'm normally into the bargain basement budget type traditional archery equipment. However, with international shipping being a little bit sketchy and no idea what's going on with Amazon, again, not encouraging panic buying, but now is as good a time as any to acquire skills and hope that you don't need them. With that all being said, this is going to be a buyer's guide that's going to take you through start to finish and hopefully entertain and educate you. Because when I first got into traditional archery, there was almost no easily digestible information. But also now, there's way too much information. And there are so many things that people are being told they need to worry about that they don't need to care about yet. I'm going to try and demystify traditional archery for a beginner and also help get you outfitted if you're a little bit more advanced and not a beginner anymore. But overall, I just want this video to help entertain you in this stressful time because I can't be there for everybody, but I'm going to try and answer the questions that I actually get asked pretty regularly and definitely more so now because who knows what tomorrow is going to bring. I feel bad about mentioning this because everything that's going on in the world, but in the interest of keeping things pretty regular... If you guys want to support the channel in a way beyond simply watching the videos, you can go to techscrabnearoutdoors.com, check out the Make It Weird shirt, the Make It Weird sticker, the Life Ain't Like the Pornos, Hunt Ain't Like the TV Show shirt, and of course my personal favorite, the Kill With Stick shirt. Now the funny thing is, a while back I talked about in a video where I would rather sell t-shirts than e-begging on Patreon because at least if you bought a t-shirt, you could wear it or at least have some wilderness toilet paper in your backpack. Now that was funny until it became not so funny anymore and a lot more true. So feel free to look into the Tech Scrab Near Outdoors merchandise in case you find yourself in need of it. Some of my most popular videos have dealt with very economical Asian recurves. However, with international shipping being a little bit worrisome right now, we're going to stay in the Three Rivers Archery catalog here for this deep dive because as long as the postal service is still functioning, Three Rivers is going to still fill online orders, which is a good thing. Now, the Edge Takedown is your classical affordable takedown recurve. It has a cut to center riser which means that it's going to be very user-friendly for a beginner because you can order it with a hair rest and a strike plate so that you don't have to worry. Now, it is a cut to center recurve, and I'll explain the differences there, but it is a 62-inch recurve, which means that it basically has almost unlimited draw length, comes in multiple different draw weights, right and left-handed, and it also is a toolless takedown. Now the string that's going to come on it is just an endless loop string, not a fancy Flemish string. However, if you can afford one, I strongly recommend the Stygian recurve from Three Rivers Archery itself because it's a 56 inch recurve that is cut to center. It is a sharp looking bow and the 56 inch rather than the 62 inches of the Fleetwood Edge means that it's going to be more maneuverable in the woods, easier to shoot sharp angles out of a tree stand, and more maneuverable indoors as far as 
target shooting across your living room so you don't have to worry about hitting light fixtures on the ceiling with a much longer limb. It's also going to be cut to center, which means that you don't have to worry about tuning an arrow rest. And I will get into the different styles of riser cut later on, as I said. It also comes with the rest already on there. And it also comes with an upgraded string. Comes in multiple different draw weights. And even though it doesn't take down, I feel that for as compact as it is and as user-friendly as it is for a beginner, that it would be a really good investment. Also comes in right and left-handed. If you're here to become a really badass target archer, you're in the wrong place. This is going to be about bow hunting and traditional archery equipment that actually works for somebody that is just beginning their archery journey. So here we go. One of the questions that I get a lot is the difference between cut to center, cut past center, and cut through center. Now I have three examples here. And we can, with modern technology, stabilize wood, and that allows us to work it very much the way that you can work metal by grinding or sanding away at it or cutting on it. It doesn't really matter what style of riser it is. What matters is the arrow shelf style. This is an example of a cut to center. As you can see, I've got a strike plate here, and you can also see that this goes down to the center line. Now the strike plate also serves the function of bringing it out a little bit past the center line. And that's going to affect how your arrow responds to this bow. As you can see here, it's radiused in, and the strike plate brings it out to the center line. And the reason that this is radiused in and is a cut past center bow is so that if you wanted to use a screw in arrow rest or an adhesive arrow rest that way you could actually get it to the center line without going so far outside of center so this is a cut past center riser and this is what I refer to as a cut through center riser. This probably looks familiar because it's the same style riser as a lot of compound bows. As you can see, I have a elevated arrow rest on here because this is a bow fishing bow. Normally this would have a wheel style rest on it. I am not a fan of cut through center risers. A lot of people are and it mystifies me. And it also makes me kind of angry when they're talking to brand new people and they start talking about how easily you can micro-tune with an elevated rest on a cut-through center riser the same precise way that you can do it with a compound bow. Now that's all well and good if you actually know how to tune that rest. But using the scientific method you probably know that you should only change one variable in an experiment at a time in order to actually be able to determine your result. So I am not a fan of recommending the cut through center riser if you can avoid it because you actually have to be able to set the center shot on this. On these two, you have a fixed arrow shelf. Now you can play around with this if you take this strike plate off it will stiffen up your arrow or if you put a second strike plate on it will weaken down your arrow and this being the cut past center riser it will be a pretty stiff arrow to start with but also you could put another strike plate on there but the point is you literally have the exact same riser every time you peel off your strike plate you stick it on and you go with it. And then you can actually tune the arrow to the bow. I'm not going to explain to you how to put together a takedown recurve because it would insult your intelligence. Caesar the chimp could figure this out. However, I will explain how to actually set it up. And this portion of the setup is with either a takedown or a one piece. It's going to be the same. Rug rest on the arrow shelf, strike plate on the sight window, and a slide 
the larger loop of the string over the upper limb. You can tell that it is for the upper limb because the lower limb loop is going to be much smaller and isn't going to want to slide over the limb nearly as easily. So once you've got that done, as you can see, the bow is relaxed. String up the bow using your bow stringer. We have gone from a relaxed bow to a braced bow. When the bow is unstrung, it is relaxed. When it is strung up, it is now braced. I define the brace height by the distance between here and the string. Some people go from here and the string. I just go from the back of the arrow shelf to the string. Now, how do you adjust your brace height? And why would you adjust your brace height? Right now, this is a brand new string, and there isn't a whole lot of brace height here. Why would you want to add more brace height? Well, you're going to hit yourself in the wrist if you don't have enough brace height. However, if you have too much brace height, it can possibly damage your bow, and it's also going to make the bow much less efficient. The bow is also going to be much less efficient if it doesn't have enough brace height as well. Now, you don't have to get super into this. Bow is now unstrung. I've slid the large loop down, and now I'm going to take off from the lower limb, and I'm going to start putting twists into this string. By putting twists into the string, I'm effectively shortening the string. And now I'm going to string this bow up, and we'll have increased the brace height. Now, as you can see, there is a greater distance between here and here. There should be instructions that come with your recurve on what you should actually use for your recommended brace height by measuring with a bow square. Me, personally, I do it by feel. You will be able to feel how the bow responds. If you're hitting yourself in the wrist, it means you don't have enough brace height. If you're hitting yourself up here by your elbow, you definitely know you have way too much brace height. If you're watching this video as a prepper, it's never a bad idea to invest in extra bow strings. Now, you can pretty much expect to get a year, maybe two years out of a single bow string, but it's also never a bad idea to have extra bow strings no matter what, because even in real life, things go wrong. I prefer a Flemish twist string, and I'll explain that here in a minute. This is an endless loop string. They're pretty economical, but they're also harsh on your limb tips, and there's some bows that just can't use an endless loop string because they are so harsh on your limb tips. The Flemish twist string is a two-ply string. As you can see, it is twisted. One of the good things about traditional archery is the fact that should you need to make a primitive string for a modern recurve, if you know how to make a primitive string, guess what? You can actually make that work. Good luck crafting cables and a string for a modern compound in a dystopia. Just saying. Which is probably why you're watching this video anyway. Because you're looking for something more simple that you can work on all on your own. With that all being said, Three Rivers sells strings and they have a pretty easy to follow string guide, but here's just a real quick example. You want a 58 inch string for a 62 inch AMO style bow. It's always going to be a little bit shorter. You want it a little bit shorter, but remember, you're going to have to set your brace height. Now, I can't tie on a knocking point to save my life, so I use brass knocking points. So you're going to want to order a knocking point pliers, some brass knocking points, and instead of using a bow square, I end up using a draw length measuring arrow, and you're going to want that for later anyway. If you set your knocking point too far down the string, you're going to end up with porpoising arrow flight rather than good clean arrow flight. You can set your knocking point too high, but also if you're bare shaft tuning, and we'll get into that in a little bit, 
But if you're bare shaft tuning and you're getting the knock high, as in the arrow's knock is well above the point, as long as it's not drastic, you're not hitting knock high if you are shooting at a target on the floor. That's just the arrow's trajectory. So I'm going to put the knocking point into the knocking point pliers. I'm going to move this up, and I do this by eye, and just butt that up against there, squeeze it down, and it's going to just make that knocking point into a circle. Now I can't tie on string knocks to save my life, but here you can see we have the knocking point on, and then if you need to move this up or down the string, as you can see there's a center tooth there, and you put that into the gap of the knocking point, and you squeeze that, and that's going to spread it out and let you take it off, or move it up the string. Now as you can see, this actually is not perfectly straight. It doesn't need to be perfectly straight. This is where I find most arrows need to knock, at least for a split finger style. But if you set it too low, you're going to get unclean arrow flight. Glove or tab? Well, I don't have any use for tabs. I kind of think they're a little bit dumb. <laughs> which is very unprofessional of me to say, but I like a double-sided shooting glove. Two reasons. It keeps you from sliding your finger cups off when you release your arrow because it's tethered back here, but also this protects your fingers and your palm so that when you're walking through the woods with a bow in this hand, you can move multiflora rose brambles out of the way with this hand quite safely if you're careful. So I prefer a Berlin or a Damascus style glove. You'll have to check out 3riversarchery.com because I can't even remember which brand this is and as you can see, it's damn near wore out. If you guys want to show your support for Tex Grab Your Outdoors, if you decide to order traditional archery supplies, you can go to 3riversarchery.com Use the code of TexGrebner in your checkout. As long as the Postal Service is still functioning, it will give you a discount on all your Trad Life supplies. Bow is put together. String is on. Bow is strung up. Brace height is set. Knocking point is set. Now we're going to talk about the draw length and talk about a realistic draw length because, God, this is a topic that makes my ponytail catch on fire. We'll get into that in a little bit. The reason we need to determine your draw length is so that we can determine your actual draw weight with real data. That way, you can actually make informed decisions about what arrows you need to buy. When the bow is strung up to brace height, the further away we come from brace height, the more weight is holding on the string. And so, what is marked on your limb isn't probably going to be what weight you're actually pulling because it's going to be marked at 28 inches unless it's a custom bow. 28 inches is the industry standard. With that being said though, most people realistically don't actually even draw 28 inches. First of all, draw length measuring arrow. You're going to want to invest in one of these. I recommend a split finger style release, one over, two under. We'll discuss that when we get to it. Anchor point. I prefer the anchor point on the corner of my mouth, under my dominant eye. And when you draw, you want to make sure that you keep a little bit of a bend in your elbow of your bow hand. That way, you're not hitting yourself with the string and not only hurting yourself, but also really getting some wild arrow flight. Because when that string hits your arm, it's gonna shock the arrow as it's leaving the string. So realistic draw length. Corner of your mouth, 
comfortable and then bend at the waist. You can get a full expansion target draw. And that works fine at a flat-footed stance indoors in a t-shirt. You can draw all the way back to your ear. Now right now I'm like 32 inches full warbo style draw. But that's not realistic to bow hunting at all. Can you imagine trying to shoot down like this out of your deer stand? Or like this out of your deer stand? I prefer what I call a four season draw. For instance, my draw length is most consistent at 27 inches. So, draw the bow back, keeping the bend in my elbow, decent form, middle finger touching the corner of my mouth. Can I bend at the actual angle that I have when I'm shooting down at an animal that would be 8 to 10 yards away out of a deer stand. Because trust me, if you hit yourself in the leg with your lower limb when you release that string, you're going to know about it. And you're going to be the first one to know. So this is helpful if you have a friend. Make sure that they are safely away from you, but close enough to read the draw length arrow. Draw back to the corner of your mouth, bend at the waist, and then have them read what the draw length arrow says at the target facing side of the riser. A memory scale is going to make determining your draw weight at your actual draw length much easier. Put the memory scale on a hard point, put the draw length arrow on the bow, put the bow string on the memory scale, tear it out, and carefully pull down the bow on the scale until the target facing side of the riser is in line with the number that corresponds to your actual realistic draw length, and then relax the bow carefully from the scale, and that's going to tell you what your actual draw weight is holding on those limbs when you're at your realistic anchor point. And then from there, you can actually have an accurate empirical set of data to know how short you can actually cut your arrows, but also the spine rating that you're going to want to use when you start out getting your arrows. I've made it abundantly clear in this video that I'm not a fan of the concept of micro-tuning. However, it is important that we have accurate data because I can't tell you how many times I've actually been trying to help somebody and let's say their bow is 50 pounds at 28 inches. That's what's marked on the limb. But because of quality control, it's not 50 pounds at 28 inches. It's more like 46 pounds at 28 inches. And they're not actually drawing 28 inches, so they're really getting like 41 pounds out of a 50-pound bow. And they can't figure out why the arrow won't tune when they're on the absolute wrong spine rating for what their bow is actually pulling at their draw weight. When you let go of the string, there's a lot of force at the back of the arrow. The back of the arrow is trying to travel faster than the front of the arrow, which makes the arrow flex. This is known as the archer's paradox, or at least the beginning of the paradox. The reason that arrow spine is important is because the further outside of center that the riser is, whether it even has an arrow shelf at all, such as an English war bow or a Mongolian horse bow, those bows are not even cut in at all, that makes your arrow much, much weaker. The further into the center line, that can make your arrow much, much stiffer, which is also why, backtracking a little bit, I'm not a fan of the 
tunable arrow rest because if it's not set properly, it makes tuning the arrow really hard. However, one of the pluses to that is that you can make a less than ideal arrow work by moving the rest in, moving the rest out. You don't need to worry about that. Moving back to the archer's paradox, the back of the arrow is traveling faster than the front of the arrow, which makes the arrow flex. That is why spine is very important, because if it is too stiff, it will flex a little bit and then snap the other way and won't be able to recover. If it's too weak, it will flex and not snap back at all. That is why if you are right-handed and shooting on the left side of the bow, if your arrow is hitting with the knock toward the left, that means that the arrow is too weak. If it's hitting with the knock toward the right, when you are right-handed and shooting on the left side of the bow, that means that it is too stiff. Now, I hate Carbon Express. Not because Carbon Express makes a bad arrow, mind you. I hate Carbon Express because the numbers that are written on the side of their arrows are not the actual spine ratings. A 250 Carbon Express Heritage, or pile driver is not the same as, say, a Black Eagle .250. Now, the reason that I say that I hated Carbon Express was because their designations are hard for beginners to understand. Everybody else in the world uses the .1000 to .150 scale, and so the closer you get to .150, the stiffer the arrow gets. For instance, like a .1000 spine arrow would be like for a 20-pound youth bow. I'm a fan of a heavy arrow. What's nice about a heavy arrow is that it absorbs a lot of energy from the bow. And it also may be traveling slower, but because it's traveling slower, it ends up being a little bit more stable. You want a straight arrow, but good is good enough. Now, if we're dealing with a crossbow, if we're dealing with a compound bow, we are now in like rocket and missile level of technology because there's a thing called resonant yaw. Imagine if you had a crooked tip on a bullet, okay? We are going at speeds with that type of weaponry where any kind of resonant yaw as that arrow is traveling, it's going to just get wild if it's not perfectly straight. However, in most cases, straight is straight enough. There is the 0.001 straightness level. There's also the 0 0.003, 0 0.005, 0 0.006. Most traditional archery arrows are 0 0.006. Is that straight enough? In my opinion, yes. But we're not going fast enough with traditional archery equipment to actually need to worry about the differences between 0 006 and 0 001. Don't even worry about it. I'm just saying because people stress out about it and it's really not that damn important. Now, this isn't going to be micro accurate either. However, pretty much all cut to center or cut past center risers are going to respond pretty much the same as long as the draw weight is at the right level for the spine rating of the arrow. If you're not ready to build your own arrows yet, that's perfectly fine. Three Rivers sells fletched up carbon arrows. And it doesn't matter what brand it is, whether it's a gold tip, a traditional only, or a Beeman. None of that matters. What matters is the spine rating of the arrow. Now, ideally, you would want your arrows to be slightly weak. The reason for that is so that you can stiffen them up if you need to by cutting length off the arrow 
So you're going to want to, should you decide to order, to request no arrow cutting service. However, we don't want it to be too weak because if it's too weak, we won't have enough arrow to actually reach our draw length by the time that we get the arrow stiffened up. Now this isn't going to be nearly as precise as if you built your own arrows from the ground up with bear shafts and such but it's going to be pretty darn close, especially because if there's something seriously wrong with your arrow, fletchings ain't gonna be able to hide it all that well. I mean, it will help, but I'm gonna get you on the right arrow shafts. For the purposes of these arrow builds, I personally prefer to use a 300 grain point with a standard insert. However, 300 grain points and 300 grain broadheads aren't all that common and so you can get the same effect with a 200 grain point because there are much more 200 grain broadheads available such as these German Jaegers and use a 200 grain point with a 100 grain brass insert. But it doesn't matter whether it's a gold tip, a Beeman, or a traditional only. What matters is the spine rating. So remember what I said about the point weight. If you want to not have to worry about ordering a separate brass insert, these recommendations will be for a 300 grain point. The point .400 spine arrow is my normal recommendation for the 40 to 45 pound draw range. And at the upper end of that, let's say you're at 47, you may need to actually cut off a little bit in order to make it land straight. However, for the 50 pound draw range, just as an example of these traditional onlys, a standard insert and a 300 grain point on a .340 shaft will work. 0.340s and 0.400s are very widely available and as you can see here they're basically going to be the same length for the most part. Now when it comes to for instance the 60 or 55 to 60 pound draw range you're probably going to want to be in the 0.300 spine rating. Now these are not ironclad recommendations, but in my personal experience, they do work very well. So for instance, let's say that we want to get traditional onlys that are fletched up. We would go and for the sake of saying that maybe it's a 50 pound bow, we're going to go six of them, maybe a dozen, and no cutting service required. Then you would want to get the 300 grain points. How good is good enough? The answer is good is good enough. When you are ready to actually get into the precision level tuning, you will be ready for it because you have perfected your form and as opposed to worrying about all the stuff that doesn't need to matter to you right now, you will have accumulated the experience to know what you need to do through experience. So I hope that that's going to be helpful. Ideally, I don't want you to have to do any cutting. Now, if you're in the top end of the draw weight ranges that I gave, you may need to cut a half inch off the arrow shaft at a time, and the shorter that you cut the arrow, the stiffer that it's going to become. Measure up from your test arrow and cut all your arrows that length. I want you to be able to do this all at home with minimal tuning. So remember how I said leave your inserts loose in case you need to cut some off of your arrow? Well, when you put in one insert, I prefer to use hot melt or hot stick, however you want to call it. Now this is helpful to have a torch, but you can also do it on a stove. And the reason that I like using hot melt is because on your test arrow, 
you can easily hot melt in your point and then heat it up and take it out easily if you're needing to cut your arrow rather than using epoxy right off the bat. Now it's always helpful to have a cup of water around to actually quench your glue once you get a point melted in. But I'm just going to heat this up a little bit. And then I'm going to put on some hot melt. Make sure that glue stays soft. And then slide it up into the arrow, rotating. And then I would quench this point. Now, main thing is, once you actually get your test arrow cut to the right length, then all your other arrows, you can actually use the epoxy. But don't use the epoxy until you actually get them cut to the right length. Use the hot melt first. Of course, the current elephant in the room is the question of trad veins. And I get asked about this all the time, and it makes me have my ponytail catch on fire. I don't care for trad veins. Not because I think they're bad. I just think that feathers are so much more simple. If you don't know what a trad vein is, it is a very flexible rubber vein by AAE that is designed to allow you to shoot off the shelf. However, I don't like messing with glue. I don't like having to do a lot of arrow shaft prep. I don't think that there is enough benefit in using a trad vein myself. I like using fletch tape. I haven't used glue in years. As you can see here, I have fletch tape on the quill of this feather, and I have all these feathers taped up and ready to go with the red side of the fletch tape on. That way, when I actually get around to building arrows, you can literally fletch an arrow in 45 seconds, especially because this fletch tape is already cured on onto the one side, which makes it peel much easier, and you don't have to wait for the fletch tape to dry, like you have to wait with glue. If you're going to fletch your own arrows at home, it's really simple, but you're going to need a fletching jig, unless you're going primitive with it, and you're going to thread wrap your feathers onto your arrow shaft. Okay, so setting up your fletching jig, really easy. This is just a simple red cheapo bonding fletching jig. Nothing fancy at all about it. It's a right wing clamp, and as you can see here, it has two knobs that allow you to line up the clamp with your arrow. That way you can make sure before you actually put on a fletching that you have it properly lined up. This is not like laser fletching crossbow bolts, ladies and gentlemen. There's not a whole lot of tuning that you actually need to do to this. Literally line it up to make sure that you're going to get good adhesion down the entire length of your fletching along your shaft then tighten down those two knobs right here, and it's good. Remember, with traditional archery, as unpopular as an opinion as this is, good is good enough. As you can see, there are ruler lines here, and I tend to mark my clamp. That way I always put the back of the feather at the same place every time. And what's nice about using tape and using feathers is the fact that you don't have to scrape glue off your clamp when you're done. The knock of your arrow goes underneath the knock on your string once you've got everything set up. I'm not a fan of the three under style. Yes, sure, with three under you can look down your arrow. However, just forget about aiming people. It's something that makes my ponytail catch on fire when I see somebody get into traditional and they instantly go three under. Now, I'm a fan of the split finger style. I prefer the anchor being the corner of your mouth under your dominant eye. 
of course, even if your anchor is the same, your draw length can vary greatly. So I'm recommending a comfortable, realistic hunting draw. Slight bend in your front elbow, draw back till your middle finger touches the corner of your mouth. Don't go for a full expansion. That's not a four season draw. When everything feels right, look at where you want the arrow to go and release the shot when everything feels perfect. Here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. The reason that I'm taping this segment in the living room, even if it isn't super cinematic, is the way to start. The honest to God way to start is no more complicated than start out at five yards. Now, when you can look at a spot the size of a pop can or your palm of your hand with all your fingers together, at five yards, you can look at a spot, put five arrows into that spot without thinking about it. Then you're ready to move back to 10 yards. When you can do five arrows into the palm of your hand at 10 yards or a soda can, you're ready to move back to 15 yards. And now it's going to get a little bit more difficult. But when you can look at a spot and put your arrow there at 15 yards, five times in a row, you're ready to move back to 20 yards. And 20 yards, despite what you might think, is a hell of a long way. When you can actually put a dozen arrows into the 10 ring of a 3D deer without thinking about it, look at it, hit your anchor, and let the arrow go. Dozen arrows, 20 yards. Then you would be ready for more advanced aiming techniques that are less instinctive or intuitive. But I hope that this helps. It doesn't have to be complicated. This is a very primal thing. Simple and primal. Now, just backtracking way the heck back to the beginning, remember how I talked about the different styles of arrow shelf? Well, when you're shooting off the shelf, it is perfectly fine for the bow to cant over just a little bit when you come to your full draw. That's very intuitive. However, if you're using an elevated arrow rest that screws in and out, if that's not set perfect, that can cause you problems where you would need to actually keep the bow straight up and down. However, in this case, elbow slightly bent, come back to the corner of my mouth, not fully extending, look at what I want to hit, and release the shot. So now that I've got the helpful stuff out of the way, just going to rant here for a second because, oh, this makes my ponytail catch on fire. First and foremost, no, you don't need an ILF, as in International Limb Fit Style Takedown Recurve, as your first bow. Yes, it's got all kinds of adjustability in it. But, do you have any idea what you're doing yet? No. If you put it together and you don't have stuff set perfect, you're spinning your wheels. Do you need an elevated arrow rest that is micro-tunable? No, you don't. Shoot off the darn shelf and learn how to shoot. And do you need a custom traditional bow for your first bow? No. It's nice. I own a couple. But you need to learn what the hell you're doing before you need to worry about making stuff complicated. And that's all there is to it. I really hope that this video has been helpful and I hope that it's entertained you during this stressful time. As always, God bless all my sports center of America. Join the NRA to protect our rights. Please come my friends or at threeriversarchery.com. Thank you very much to those of you involved in law enforcement and those of you serving the military. And thanks for watching Tech's Grabbing Your Outdoors.